clouds and record. Okay. So recording. All right. So if you guys remember, over the last couple of lectures, we uh, introduced ArcGIS and we did some data analysis using ArcGIS. So let's see today how we can do risk analysis. Yeah. So how can we do risk analysis? So risk analysis, we need to do several things. The first thing, we need to do hazard modeling. Second thing, we need to do exposure modeling. Third thing, we need to do vulnerability analysis. So let's see how can we do these step by step. Sometimes like you, I, I believe most of you heard the term risk analysis. So when we hear this term, some people like confuse this term with hazard modeling. Like if I model the hazard, like uh, some people get some data about the hazard and they model 100 year event, 500 year event. So they tell you the risk of having a hazard at this location is 0.2% or 0.01%. So 0.01% there's a chance of in one, one in a hundred year that you will have an event with a specific characteristics like flood depths, wind speed, surge height, significant wave height, with all these characteristics to have in here. But this is a risk of the hazards to happen. What we are looking for a risk, if this hazard happened, how much damage that my building is gonna have. So that's what we want to know. The risk of having damage, not the risk of the hazard to happen. Because it's okay that the hazard happened and didn't do anything to my property, right? Okay, like I live, like the hazard happened here, but I live there. I don't like, I don't care. The hazard happened, I didn't got impacted, and that's it. That's that's like that's what is more important than the hazards happen. What are the consequences? So to go to the consequences, we have to go through a process. We have to know our, like when we do this at the community level, we need to know our building inventory. What buildings that we have? Do you guys think like a building like the one that we are here should have the same vulnerability like a single family home or a multifamily home? Every building has its own characteristics. It's own uh, like this building, maybe it's a steel structure. It's completely different than the wood structures or the mystery structures. This building is a multi-story. Other buildings are one or two story. Everyone has its own vulnerability and this will take us to uh, what we talked about, the building archetypes. We need to have some building archetypes that can describe the entire building inventory. Like we need to have one archetype or two archetypes that can be assigned or be represented of one single, of single family homes. And when I say single family homes, it should be one story. Like if I have like a bunch of different one story single family homes, maybe they are sharing the same characteristics and I can assign one building archetype to represent all of them. But when I deal with wind hazards, the roof shape is very important in the vulnerability. So if a one has a head roof, so it should be different from one that has gable roof. So I should have maybe an archetype that has head roof and one of one another one that is gable roof. Maybe the shape of the building, L shape is completely different than the rectangle is completely different than the C. So if you see that has a big difference on the vulnerability, so I should have archetypes that are C shape that are L shape, and and when you increase the number of archetypes that can represent the community, so your analysis accuracy will be much more. However, when we do community level analysis, it's um, sometimes it doesn't make any difference. Like if you have one archetype that has one of, one of them is gable, one of them is hip roof, two archetypes to represent all the one story building, maybe this is enough because the difference in the damage or in the losses is gonna be like 5% or 2%. Yeah, maybe this is, important or this is can be important at the building level but when we do community level assessment it's not that important like at two percent or five percent that's why we, we reduce the number of archetypes that we can use to represent all these different building typologies within within the community so first thing is hazard modeling and the second thing is to identify your community model, like to develop a community model. And when I say community model, is to model the different building typologies within the community. For example, let's see here. Let, let's make zoom in, but not very, very close because sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah, so here, 
if I zoom to this neighborhood and if I click on any of these buildings, like I go to identity and I click on this building. So this building, it's residential, okay? Number of stories, it's a three-story building, okay? This building is also residential and the number of stories is one. Should them be the same archetype? No, they shouldn't be the same archetype. So if you look at this one, it has F archetype two, and I believe the other one, maybe it's two as well. Let's see, because I don't have much, arch no, it's, uh, it's a four. Two and four, because two is, yeah, so the, the first one is one story. So I have an archetype that is one story, but I have another archetype. It's a two stories. It's not three stories like this one, but I don't have any other archetypes. I only have one story and two story. So which one should I pick for this three stories? The closest one is a two story. That's when I mean like, yeah, I only have few archetypes. So I see which one that can not perfectly represent the one here, but that is close to this one. Because if you want another one, three story, you will have to spend six months to develop the vulnerability of this archetype, of this three story archetype. So you'll have to take this archetype, divide it into components, develop fragilities, and then develop building fragilities. And this will take lots of time. You can do this for every building in the community, but this community might have like thousands of buildings that are different from each other. That's why we, we, we develop a term that is called minimal building fragility or minimal building archetypes. When we say minimal building archetypes, we mean the minimum number of archetypes that can represent the different building typologies within the community that allows us to make risk informed decision about this community. Like they are minimized in a way that it doesn't impact the accuracy that much, okay? It's better than nothing. Okay, so let's actually, there's a paper that I'm, I was working on. What if I represented the entire community with one archetype? Like, let's say that we have, maybe this is the flood deaths and this is the damage or losses. Okay, so one archetype will have like a curve, something like this. Another one has something like this. So if I have 15, it will be something like this, lots of curves, okay? This archetype one, archetype two, archetype three, each one of them represent different archetype. What if, if I got a mean of all of these and represent them with one archetype, or I pick any archetypes, how much losses that I will get at the community level? This is a very, very rough resolution, okay? That you pick one archetype and you assume that all your community is this archetype. But what if, if you, this is the only archetype that you have? You only have one function, one damage function for one building, and this is the only thing that you have. So this is all what are you gonna use because you don't have any other thing. What if we increase our resolution a little bit? What if we have three archetypes, one of them residential, one of them commercial, and one of them as a social institution like school or a hospital or a community center or any of these? Okay, right now my resolution is much better. I can say all the residential buildings, whatever the number of stories, whatever the number of foundation type are gonna take this residential archetype. And, and all the commercial buildings are gonna take this archetype. All the social institutions are gonna take this archetype. So you are increasing your resolution. What if you have two residential archetypes, one of them as a two story, one of them as a one story. So you have much more options. As soon as your option is getting increased, maybe, your analysis results getting better, right? But I don't know this. Like, actually I started this paper, I just like was curious. What if I have 15 flood archetype? What if I reduce this archetype to only one and represent the entire community? So for a community, I got flood losses that is 80 million. If I represent them with one archetype, if I get 75 million, that's really good accuracy. Okay, so it, it will save me the hassle of developing all these archetypes by, by choosing one, generalized archetype that can represent the entire building. So what if like I got 30 million rather than getting 80 million? Oh no, that's, that's, there is a problem. I can't use this. What if I tried the three different archetypes? So this is like, I see the accuracy and then this is how it works, okay? Definitely if you have a hundred archetype, it will be much better, but it will take lots of work. I believe there is a hundred of archetypes for earthquake wakes because earthquake wakes 
People have been working on developing vulnerability functions for earthquakes over like 50 years. So there are hundreds of archetypes of earthquakes. But for wind and flood, there are less because there is still like this concept, especially in flood, the concept of fragility is new. So that's what I want to talk about. So the first thing is to have a hazard. The second thing is to model the community, to identify the building archetype of this community. Now, let me tell you how we can do this, how we can identify the archetype of each building. First, we need data about these buildings. We need to know, like we need, you need to know two things. You need to know your archetypes, the archetypes that you have in hand. And the second thing, you need to have data about the community buildings. Like I'm telling you, there's, there's only 19 wind archetypes out there, 19. There's no more than 19 wind archetypes. And you have this data about the community. Can you assign these 19 wind archetype to these buildings? That's, so you will have to tell me some information. I need to know if this building is residential or commercial. I need to know the number of the story. I need to know the roof shape of the building. I need to know lots of information so that I can assign the residential building that is one story and has this roof shape, which is head, to each one of these buildings. So, and this is what the data that I have. Like I have, for example, here, what is the number of employees? What is the uh, occupancy? Is it commercial? I have the number of units, I don't care. You have the foundation time. You have a bunch of information that you can use. But if, let's assume that, what if there is some information that's missing? You either go collect them, but if it will take lots of time, so you will have to make assumptions. You will have to make assumptions like, we will have to make assumption that this building is a hip roof, assuming that most of this community are using hip roof. Like you go to Google, Earth and navigate over this, over the, like big, like some spots, check spots, and you check these buildings. Uh, if they are hip or gable, like if you pick 10 spots and five, let's say eight of them were hip roof. So, okay, I'm gonna assume that all these buildings has a hip roof. We, at some point, we have to make some assumptions. Like if we are dealing with hundreds of thousands of buildings, so we need to make assumptions so that we can run our analysis. As I told you before, for this community, like the, the like the most important assumption when we do flood damage analysis is the burst of floor elevation. And to know the burst of floor elevation for these hundreds of thousands of buildings, we need to navigate Google Street Map View building by building to know them. And we'll take lots of time. So we have to make some assumptions based on the foundation type. So we know the foundation type. These numbers represent types of foundation. And we know that if a building on a slab of grade, we can assume it's one feet from the ground, like from 0.5 feet, one feet. If it's a crawl space, so the crawl space is usually the building is elevated by three to four feet from the ground. If it's like building that is on a pile, like elevated from the ground, it's always one story elevated, like 10 foot. So based on the foundation type, we were able to assume the building elevation from the ground and knowing the ground elevation from the digital elevation map, we add the, the, the increase in the elevation or the elevated building on the top of the ground elevation so that we can know what is the first floor elevation of the building. Sometimes we do check spots, sometimes they are good, sometimes they are bad, but this is our best that we can do, right? So this is the story behind community so let's do an example and see how we can move from hazard to exposure. So last time I showed you guys uh, this, like this is the, let's zoom to this layer. So this is Galveston, Texas, and this is the building polygons within Galveston, Texas. And I'm, what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to do wind damage analysis. So let's see how can we do wind damage analysis. First, I need a wind hazard map. So I have here a wind hazard map for Hurricane Ike. So I have Ike, and actually I have for Ike, Hurric I have for, for Galveston, I have Hurricane Ike in 2008, but I also have some return period events, like an event that has 0.2 chance, an event has 1% chance. This is a 100 year event and 2% chance. So what do you guys think? What is the 2% chance event? What is the return period of two chance, 2% 2 50 year? So you have the 50 year, you have the 100 year, and also you have, what is that? 500 year, the 0.2% chance. 
So it's 0.2 over 100, so it will be 1 over 500. So I have all these hazards, but let's do Ike. So for Ike, I have these hazard maps. I I'm only interested right now in wind, so I will search for maximum wind velocity. This is the maximum wind velocity. Let's grab this hazard map here. Let's put it here. All right, and let's build the permits. Okay. All right, so this is the wind hazard map. If I want to make it multicolors, to it's actually the maximum wind speed in this hazard map is 41 meter per second. Um, this is how the wind speed is variating. Like if, if I click here, the wind speed is blue, it's a 33 meter per second. If I click here, The wind speed is 24 meter per second. Okay, so I have the wind speed. The next step is I want to know the wind speed at each building, right? So that I can do a damage analysis. So to do this, I have to convert these polygons to points. So I go to search and search feature to point. I put this feature. Let's do it. I don't think last week we had the points. Point, yeah. yeah, it's uh, we'll take a second. It's already done. I just like want to check here the classes lecture nine. Shape files. Galveston Island building. Oh, well, yeah, we have the points here. All right. But it's already created the points. So if we want, so the next step is to extract the wind speed at each one of these points. So let me um, open the class. We can use the building points that we developed from before. Galveston. Island building points. Let's remove this one or let's deactivate it. Let's see what we have here. Open attribute table. Yeah, last time we calculated the digital elevation in meter and we calculated the flood depth in meter. So we got the exposure to flooding. So we know what is the level of exposure of each building to flooding. What we are going to do now, right now is to know the exposure of each building to wind by calculating the wind speed at each one of these points. So what I'm going to do here, I'll go to the arc toolboxes, I'll go to spatial analyst tool, and I want to do extraction, extract multi-values to points. And I have here is my points, and my raster map is Ike hurricane wind velocity, and I will name it. Let's say V meter second, and let's name it Ike. Let's say, okay. Close, let's close this shape file and reopen it. of an attribute table, we will find here, we have Ike velocity meter second, and you'll have the wind speed at each building. If you click at any of these points, if you go down, you will find that you have the flood depths and also you have the, the wind speed at each building. So right now we calculated the exposure of each building to wind and flooding, okay? So the next step after hazard modeling, exposure modeling, what is the third one is the vulnerability. For vulnerability, we need to know, we need to have fragility functions because fragility or damage functions calculate what is the damage or what is the losses for each building. And then we need 
if we have a bunch of them, like if we have 19 archetypes, we need to know what is the archetype of each building. So the archetype of each building, I'm not, I'm not gonna like go in deep to do this. As I told you, you need to have uh, some data about the buildings. And what I do is I get, I, I take this shape file into MATLAB and make some if statements, or you can take it to Python, whatever. And you make some if statements. And this if statements will tell if this building is residential, so you are reducing, like you have a 19 archetype, residential, commercial, social. If it's residential, so you are knowing that this building will be one of four archetypes that you have for residential. So the next thing to do is to filter which one. So is it like Hip or Gable, or so, sorry, let's do number of stories. Is it one story or two story? So if it's one story, re you reduce your options from four to two. And then you will check, is it Gable or Hip? If it's Gable, so you reduce your option to one. So that's what we do. We do some if statements to check the conditions of the building, okay? Like we check a few things. What is the building occupancy, residential? So if it's residential, uh, if is it like a uh, uh, number of stories, is it one or two or multi-story? So if it's this, you do another if statement, is it gable or head? And then finally, you will say this will be archetype one. And then you do other if statements for the other building archetype. So that's what I, I do. It also depends on your data, what data that you have. So if you don't know the shape of your data, like the shape of the roof of your building, so you will have to make assumptions and you will have to assume that all these buildings are never gable. So right now you are remo removing one layer of your check, which is the roof shape. If you don't know the number of stories, you will have to remove the other layer. That's what I was telling you. Once you have more data, so right now your archetypes are useful because you can assign them to a building that you already know more information about them. Okay, let's now see what is in the literature in terms of vulnerability functions. There is a paper, Actually, out there, there are many papers about wind fragility function, but this paper has actually most of the wind archetypes out there. It's called Minimal Building Fragility Portfolio for Damage Assessment of Communities subjected to, subjected to Tornadoes. So from first glance, you will say, okay, this is for, for tornadoes. We are doing hurricanes right now. This paper did wind damage or wind fragilities for straight line winds, like winds from hurricanes, but also they have another fragilities adjusted for tornadoes. So it has both. So let's go check this paper. So if I going down there, I will find that they have 19 building archetype tornado, like they are named T, like for tornado, T1, T2, up to T19. They have residential wood building, a small rectangle plan, gable roof, one story. So right now, they have one story gable roof. They have gable roof, two stories. They have gable roof, one story, medium rectangle. So right now, they have the size of the building. So right now, you have more information. So what I will do with this piece of information, I would go to my, my uh, ArcGIS shapefile. And, and when I do the, uh, we call this mapping. This term is very important. When you assign archetypes to this building, we say we are mapping our archetypes to the community. So we need to do this mapping. Right now, I told you if the building, what is the number of the stories? What is the, the occupancy? What is the, uh, the roof shape? Right now, you have another layer, which is small rectangle, medium rectangle, big rectangle. How can I know this? They should tell me. What is the, the specs for this? What is the size of the building? Is it a 10, is it a 1,000 square foot? Is it 2,000 square foot? So what I do, I calculate the area of all these buildings and then make another layer for the area. If the area is less than 1,000, assign this archetype. If it's more than 1,000, assign the other archetype. So I have more information. Let's get back to this paper. Okay, so I have these archetypes. I have five residential, I have a uh, business like uh, here, uh, archetype number six, business and retail building, light industrial, heavy industrial, elementary school, high school, hospital, community center, 
large box, a small box, like warehouses, mobile homes, shopping centers, office buildings. So you have lots of archetypes. The next step is, as I told you, is to develop a MATLAB or a Python code that can map these archetypes to the community based on the information that you have. So finally, you will end up with having another field, something like this, that tells you what is the wind archetype of this building. And then you will have numbers, like based on what I did on MATLAB or Python, I, I knew that this building is archetype number three, this archetype is number four, and another one is three. So I have, I did this analysis to identify these wind archetype. And that's actually what you are supposed to do in your project. You will have a bunch of informations about the community and you have a bunch of archetypes, how can you map these? It's a very simple, you do, it, you do a for loop and like you will say for from I equal one, building number one, check F, F, F statements and then keep looping building by building until you identify the archetype of each building. All right, so. Have to create archetypes, right? No, no, I might give an idea about if we picked an archetype and we want to develop fragility for this archetype, just one archetype and see how, how the process looked like. Uh, okay, let's get back here. Yeah, so here they have more information. They tell you, let's uh, rotate this, rotate to the right. Yeah, they tell you for archetype number six, this is the number of stories. This is the footprint area. This is the height, number of windows, number of doors. They tell you everything about these archetypes. And actually there's much information here, like uh, industrial buildings, they tell you everything like here. Yep, and here they tell you how they develop fragilities, what functions that they use, the probability, this is the fragility. And um, yeah, this is how they develop the fragility. Okay, yeah, so here's a very important table. Here's a distinguish between approach A and approach B. So I told you this paper is for tornadoes, right? So what is special about it is they did two approaches. If you are dealing with tornado, tornadoes, you are going what is called uh, tornado patterns. This SSC uh, ASC 710. And then if you are using approach B for straight line winds, so your tornado factors will be one. So you will only have one. So we are gonna use approach B, not approach A, because we are working with hurricanes. So we are not gonna use this. But if you are working with tornadoes, when coming from tornadoes, you will have to use approach A. All right. And here they tell you the uncertainties that they have. They tell you uh, like the uncertainties, uh, like as you guys, if you guys are familiar with the wind pressure, this is the equation of the wind pressure and this is the uh, factors. So they tell you what is the uncertainties in these factors, the mean and the coefficient of variation in each one of these factors, like the, the, the gust factor, the CBs, the K, everything. But this is I'm not interested in right now. What I'm interested in is this table. Yeah. They have fragilities for components, like they have fragilities for windows, for doors, but I'm not interested in the component. I'm interested in the interested in the fragility of the entire building. So I'm going scroll, going to scroll down. Yeah, here we go. These are the fragilities for the entire buildings. Like they tell you. They tell you here, the damage of state one, these are the fragility parameters of damage of state one. This is the fragility parameters of damage of state two, damage of state three, damage of state four, for approach A and approach B. So what are the fragility parameters? Forget all what this paper about. We just need this table. We need the fragility functions of the portfolio of the archetypes, the 19 building archetypes. That's what we need. So what are these numbers? And we will focus on approach B because we are dealing with hurricanes. Razor. Yeah. 
We don't have an eraser. Does any of you have any tissue or something? Yeah. All right. So what are these fragility parameters? When we develop fragility, or like for damage state, as I told you before, we can develop fragility for components. This fragility will be something like if we're talking about wind speed, we will have V here. Let me find here. We have V and we have the probability of exceedance on this curve. And let's talk about wind. We're developing a fragility for a wind. This wind or like if we have wind here, it will be something say that this is one, I cannot exceed one. There will be something like this, right? And this fragility will tell me what? Will tell me the failure probability of this window, not the damage state. It will tell me if this window is gonna fail or not, but it's not like this, not zero one. It will tell me what is the probability of failure of this window. Like if we're talking here, it wouldn't be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So if I have 40, so I have probability of failure of this window of 50%, 0.5. Okay. So this, when we talk about component fragility, component fragility, tell me what is the probability of failure of this window? But the thing is, when we develop these fragilities, we don't get a curve like this, or a curve may be something like we get points, like we get something like something like this it doesn't have a shape or just like a cumulative function right because how we develop this we will like have a for loop and this for loop we go like wind speed like from 0.1 meter per second and we keep a step 1000 a step or something until we get maybe 100 meter per second Okay, and then at each wind speed at point one, you keep doing Monte, what is called Monte Carlo simulation. You see, you have like your window, as I told you before, you will have 1000 value of its resistance, like, like a value here, here, there, 1000 value. And you keep it checking for each value if it's fail or not. Like this is fail, fail, not fail, fail. Fail, not fail. At each one of these when speed, you keep counting the fails and you have 1000 value here. Then you divide the number of fails over the 1000 to get the probability of failure. So this is how we get probability of failure at just one when speed. You keep doing this for all the when speed and this is what gets you the probability of failure. And you keep connecting the dots. The probability of failure at 30, the probability of failure at 40, 50, 60, and then you connect them they will give you like a random curve, or I know it, the curve should be like going out like this, but, but it's not as smooth like this one. What we do is we fed these curves to log normal distribution. We fed these curves to log normal CDF. Like we get it like this, and we try to find what is the best log normal CDF that can fit our data so that. When I transfer this data to somebody else, I don't have to give him an Excel sheet with each one of these points. I only give him two numbers, the logarithmic mean and the logarithmic variance. Once he used them, he can develop this curve. And this is what is this number about, but this is for the building level. So what I talked about here is the component level. Building level is the same thing. When we do building level analysis, everyone developing fragilities, they should have a table like this, describe the damage state. So for example, I have here four damage state from one to four. This is a slide, moderate, extensive, complete. Each damage state has a description, a description of what, of what kind of damage that each component in my building can have. So for example, damage state one tells you that you will have damage to the roof covering from 2% to 15% along with windows or doors, one or two windows or doors to be damaged. Uh, parapet, no damage to the parapet. Garage door, no. Roof, no. 
load bearing rules, no. You go to the extensive, you have damage more than 75% to your roof cover, like the sheeting. The windows and doors, typically 75% of your doors and windows are broken. Barbet, typically, yes, there is damage to the barbet. Garage door, yes. 15% to the roof structure, like the structure itself have a 15%. The bearing walls, yes, there is damage. This is the description. So right now, it is not only one component that I have to check its damage. It's a bunch of components. So you will have to make four loop that's very, very big, and you check component by component. If this component has this level of damage and this component has this level of damage, level of damage, and based on all of them, this damage state one is exceeded. And you keep doing this 1,000 times as well. So finally, you will have another one or damage state one, and you will see if it's exceeded or not, exceeded or not. And then you count the number of exceedance and you divide them in the total, now, total number of simulations and then you get the probability of exceedance of damage state one. So this is how we develop fragility function. And this is only for one wind speed. And then you keep going one by one to identify the, the probability of exceedance at each one of these wind speeds. And you will end up with right now V, and here is the probability. But this probability is probability of exceedance. This probability is probability of failure. So I will have a curve, something like this. This is damage state one. And I will do the same for damage state two, damage state three. So damage state two will be something like this. Damage state three, something like this. Damage state four, something like this. So at the higher wind speed, like if I have wind speed like 90, uh, for example, 90 mile per hour, I will go up. Definitely, the lower damage states will be more, have more, much more probability of exceedance than the, the, the biggest damage state. So I have 100% exceedance of damage state one, but I have 70% exceedance of damage state four. Because if you have a very, very high wind speed, yeah, I already could have like my shingles where like uh, fall off, I have lots of damage, but this damage is not complete. It's not 100% complete damage, but definitely you exceeded the slight damage and the moderate damage. So both of them are at 100%, but you have low probability, a high probability of being and extensive damage and medium probability in being in complete damage. This is when we do building level. So we have damage states like this. And same thing, when we develop these fragilities, we get curves like this. The curve is something, for example, something like this one. And we do log normal fitting. We fit this curve for a CDF log normal distribution to get these parameters like lambda and uh, exceed. Okay, so this is the logarithmic mean and this is the logarithmic variance for the components and same thing for the entire building, something like this. I'm gonna give you this paper. So, uh, or you can search online actually. Uh, it's in the ES7, uh, ESC, uh, Journal of structure engineering. Yep. Uh, the second thing is how can I use these parameters to develop the fragility function? So that's what we are going to do here right now. So let's see how can we do this in the 30 minutes that we have. So basically, you need to have an Excel sheet of these numbers. So actually, I have this Excel sheet. when the fragilities, and I have the building archetype from T1 to T19, and I have damage state one up to four, and I have the, the mean and standard deviation, the logarithmic mean and the logarithmic standard deviation. And then I will start to develop this in MATLAB. So in MATLAB, first I start my MATLAB by closing everything and clearing everything. And I want to read the Excel sheet that I have all these parameters. I want to read this Excel sheet. 
so that MATLAB can read all these numbers. Then here, I, I read my Excel sheet, XL, XLS read, and I read my fragility functions. And then this will read like, let me run this part. So when I run this part, we'll read my Excel sheet. I believe all of you used MATLAB before, right? Okay. So right now I have my Excel sheet. I, I named it damage state DS log normal parameters for when. Try to name them like something that represent the data inside the file. So right now I have the data, the numbers of each damage state. The column number, the, the very two columns is damage state one, damage state two, three, up to four. And I have 19 rows for my 19 building archetypes. The second thing, is I want to, from these data, I want to know what is the probability of exceedance at a specific wind speed. I want to draw these fragility functions. So what I did, I want to know how is these fragilities look like for wind speed from zero up to 100 meter per second. Okay, and I, 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 I put the number of the building archetypes, I name it N archetype wind, 19 and the number of damage state and damage state for when are four damage states then i want to separate like tabulate damage state one separate separately from damage state two and damage state three and damage state four so i made here uh like i want to separate muse that means and the sigmas from this table so i started to have a table that has number of rows equal to the number of archetypes and number of columns equal to the damage states. And then I put all the means, I know that the mean is here, this column and this column is a mean, this column and this column are the mean for damage state one, damage state two, up to four, and this is the standard deviation. So that's what I did here. Column number one, three, five, and seven are mean for damage state one, two, three, and four. Same thing for sigma. I put two, four, six, and eight as a sigmas here so that I can separate the mean from the sigma. Then this, the next thing is to calculate the wind speed from these log normal parameters. So what I did here, I calculated the probability of exceedance for each wind speed, for each archetype, and for each damage state. So it's a 3D matrix that has three things. It has, what is, the, what is the wind speed for each wind speed? It has the number of archetypes and also has the damage, uh, uh, sorry, the, the damage state. So what I want to know, what is the exceedance probability for each wind speed, for each archetype, for each damage state in each archetype. So it's a three things that we need to identify because this is this is complete, this is very important. Like if you have a wind speed that hit a community, so the first thing is that the parameters that you want to know, if you have a wind speed 80 meter per second or 80 mile per hour, and your building archetype is seven. And you want to know damage state one. So these are the three parameters that you that characterize your damage. All right. So, so what I did is I made a four loop from a three layers for wind speed from one up to the length of the wind. So I have wind speed from zero up to 100 meter per second. Yeah, so this is SI unit. So it's meter per second. So, okay, so I'm done with the win. And then for each archetype from one to 19 and for each damage state from damage state one to damage state four, calculate the exceedance probability. Okay, so here the, the exceedance probability will be function in the wind speed and the archetype and also in the damage state. So three parameters. And this function actually use the log normal parameters to generate a CDF with this parameters. It's called log normal CDF. This is a MATLAB function. It's have a name, log in CDF. Generate uh, a cumulative distributing, distributed function, a cumulative distribution function, CDF, that has a log normal distribution with the parameters that we have from this paper, lambda and XE. 
because this is not normal. Like the, the values here are the log normal parameters of our fragilities. We don't fit fragilities with normal distribution because normal distribution has negative side. Log, because wind speed will never be negative or flood depths will be will never be negative. That's why we always fit the fragilities as a log normal function. And actually, if we go up in this paper, we'll show you how the log normal fitting function look like. Yeah, this one. So we always... This is how is the fragility function, the CDF fragility function, ln x, and then you have lambda and xe. All right, let's get back to the MATLAB. Yeah, and if I run this part, like run this section, right now I have the value of this one. This is a 3D function, so if I click on this one, it will it will show like uh, it will not show you a 3D. It will show you show you a 2D at each velocity. Like it will show you what is the uh, the exceedance probability at velocity number one for archetype one uh, one to nineteen and from and for damage state one to four. So it will not show you 3D. Then the second thing, let's visualize this right now. I have the exceedance probability for each wind speed, for each archetype, for each damage state. If you want to plot that, you will make a for loop of 19, like I need 19 figure of this for each archetype, okay? So I say for I from one to 19, for damage state from one to four, plot figure number one, plot the, view, the wind speed with the exceedance probability for all the winds, because here I put the two dots, because the first one is the wind. The first one here is the wind. So what I'm plotting right now is all the wind, okay? V wind with the value B, the exceedance probability for archetype number one and for damage state number one, from damage state from one to four. So what I will do is I do archetype one and then damage state one, and you will keep looping in this loop, one, two, three, four. And once you are done with this loop, it will plot your fragilities, damage state one, damage state two, three, and four in the same figure. And then once you are done, there's another loop that you will have to go through, which is loop number two for building archetype number two. And then you will go damage state one, two, three, four, and then plot, and then go your archetype three, until archetype 19. So if I run this, it will be something like this. Let's see what will happen. It's exceedance probability. Yeah, it's exceedance probability. Yep. So right now, it says MATLAB has experienced low level of graphics. Don't know why. Let's. Hmm. Unfortunate. Okay, let's uh, close ArcGIS and see what will happen. And let's rerun this. It's first time to have them. So we should get functions that shows us how is the fragility look like. I think uh, because if it's um, on Zoom, so when we have many tabs open, the fragility will not show up. But anyway, once we run this curve, it will, we will get something like this, these fragilities. But what I did is to separate them by archetype. Each archetype, like 19 figure, because if you look here, I have from archetype one to 19, and then I keep 
plotting a figure i so my plotting are 19 because it's based on this one by archetype these plots in this paper are based on the damage states for the four damage so he plotted the 19 archetypes damage states this are 19 curve for damage state one for your 19 building archetype this is damage state two for your 19 building archetypes what i'm trying to do here is to separate them by archetype like archetype one has four damage state one two three and four um, let me actually try to plot only one curve i just like want to show we don't have to, to see all the 19 let's uh let's try only one figure one Mm -hmm. What was that? Line 14. Line 14? 40? No, um, I mean like when I plot it, it will only plot one figure. So let's let's try this. Maybe it will it will plot the the first one. It will plot the last one. I believe so. I'm not sure if it's still running. Uh, really? Oh, okay. I didn't close them. Yep, let's do only one plot. I just like uh, want to show you how is the uh, damage states look like, but anyway, uh, will be something. Uh, let's open the paper. Yeah, I will show you something similar here published. Yeah, it will be something like this. You will see the, the three damage state, the, the four curves, something like this coming together with each other. I, I just wanted to plot them for the uh, 19 building archetype. Actually, I've run this good and was like working good and plotted the 19, but maybe because I have zoom open, so the graphics, I'm short and short of graphics. But anyway, yeah. So this is, will plot me the curves and will show me how my curves look like. The, the second thing I want to do is I want to know what is the damage for each building that I have from Galveston, Texas. This is the point. I'm grabbing these fragilities, and then I grab the building points that I have from ArcGIS with their wind speeds, and I make a loop for each building to go in each fragility to identify which fragility that each building will make based on the wind archetype, and then calculate the exceedance probability of each damage state. So let's do how can we do this? Let's see. So first thing, once we loaded the fragilities is I want to load the building inventory that I have for Galveston. So this is the function that we use to read shape files. Do you guys remember? We have shape files of the buildings. So I name it S1 and did shape read the Galveston County buildings points. So I should have actually the building points in the same file. So what I do, I'm, I have a folder and put all the data, the Excel files, the shape files, and all in this folder along with the MATLAB file. So that MATLAB can read the data inside the same file. So your data should be in the same file with your MATLAB code file. Okay, so I have them, all of them here. Like, let me open it, open them here. Like I have MATLAB wind damage analysis and I put all the data here. I have, here's my MATLAB file and these are the building uh for galveston and here's the wind fragility parameters all of them are in the same file then i go back to matlab and then i read this shape file this but the thing is i don't want all the data in this shape file this shape file has lots of data okay i closed arcgis i thought it will help but yeah so I have lots of data. If you guys remember, I have the foundation, the building area, the uh, number of stories, the number of units. I don't need all of this data. The only two things that I need for wind damage analysis 
what is the wind speed at each building and what is the wind archetype? These two things that I need. So here's, that's what I did. I extracted the wind archetype from this data. So this is the, uh, the uh, function that we use. We, I, I made a, a data name, it's called wind archetype and it's equal to extract field from S1, it's called wind archetype. I'm extracting these fell. Like if I, let me run this section. Yeah. So once he reads the shape files, I'm asking to extract the wind archetype and I'm also extracting the V wind. This is the two things that I need. The second thing that I, I had to do is some of the buildings that I have doesn't have an archetype. So it doesn't match any archetypes. So you have to choose two options. You either don't develop anything for them, like you exclude them from your analysis. You will have to remove them from your data because your MATLAB code will not run. It will stop at this building. It tells you there is something missing. I can't find a function. So you either remove them from the data or you keep them and make some assumptions. And that's what I did. I did what? I asked MATLAB if the wind archetype is less than or equal zero, that means like if, if the wind archetype is zero, that means it doesn't have an archetype. I assigned wind archetype one because I don't have any other options. And other than that, if like this loop, like it loops inside the building, if it's fine zero, so it assign one. But if it's fine five or six or seven, so keep it there. So this is the second, the second thing. Else, the wind archetype I is equal to wind archetype I. So if you find if you find zero, but this, if you find number, keep the number. All right. So right now I'm done. Like if if you look here at S1, it, it's a, it, the shape file. It has 40 fields, and I only needed two, the wind archetype and the uh, the wind velocity. Okay, right now. I have my buildings and I have the wind speed and here's the uh, the shape file. And if we goes all the way, we can know where's the wind speed at. The second thing is right now, I have my fragilities and I have the wind speed for each building, the wind archetype for each building. Right now, I want to know what is the exceedance probability of each damage state for each building. So I make another loop to calculate the probability of exceedance a damage state for wind. Here, this one. So I created since, right. So here I will have four numbers. So let's assume that we calculate the exceedance of damage states for one, for building number one. So building number one has wind of 50 meter per second. So we'll go here. What we want to do is we calculated the wind speed from zero to 100 with the steps. Let's see what steps that we have. Uh, point one. But let's just, so the wind speed that we will have, we will have like 50, 50.1, 50.2. What if from the rest of the map, we got wind speed that is 52.35? this one speed. So we do interpolation. So we did an interpolation function with the wind speed that we have to get what is exactly the exceedance probability of each one of these damages state. Because you have points and we do interpolation between these points to get what is exactly the exceedance probability. And we will have four values, one for damage state one and for damage state two, for damage state three, for damage state four, since we have four damage states. All right, so what I did here, I created a matrix. It's called the probability of exceeding damage states for when, and I make it general damage states, and it has four columns. And I, in, I initialize these metrics with zeros, and then start to fill these zeros. So what I did here, I calculated B damage state column one will be damage state one. Column two will be damage state two. Column three will be damage state three. So it will be something like this. It will be a matrix, something like this. It will have damage state one, damage state two, damage state three, 
damage is taken. And this is called B, BS for when. And what I, what I did here in the first one is the probability of exceeding damage state one, since I put one, at all the wind speed, like from wind speed, uh, sorry, this is for wind archetype. So I, here's the archetype. So what I'm doing here, for, for building number one, over the lens of all the wind archetypes, like over all the buildings, like I have here 172,000 buildings. Okay, so for building number one, calculate what is the probability of exceedance for building number one, exceedance for damage state one, and then for damage state two, damage state three, and damage state four. And then this function do interpolation for two Ds. It, its name is interpolate, and this is, I believe this is L, not one, maybe one, not sure. And then we have interpolate and I put the wind speed for this building and this actually come from here. Sorry, this is the wind speed. Let me show you. So the, the, the input for this function, you give the X and Y values from the original function. Like you give this function, the wind speed here, and also the vector of the probability of damage, you get these two to your function, and then you give this function, what is the new wind speed that you want to interpolate the probability of exceedance of damage? So for example, this function has 1,000 value, like from, sorry, not 1,000, from zero to 100.1. So I believe it's 1,000 value. So you give all these wind speeds and all the exceedance probability, all the point x, y, and then you give it the new x that you want to interpolate at to get the new y. So that's what we did here. I give this function all my wind speed, and then the exceedance probability for this wind speed for this archetype, and the third value is the new wind that I calculated for this building. So interpolate at this wind value. So it has three parameters. The first is the x, y of my function. Let's assume that we have any function with x, y parameters, like any curve has x and y values. You give this x and y for your function and you ask the function, what is the value of y at this x? So here's what, what this function is doing. And I do it for damage state one, damage state two, damage state three, up until damage state four. So what I calculated here is the exceedance of damage state. Can we repeat that for I'm not sure I'm getting like the, the interpolation. Yeah. Okay, so for the interpolation, basically, I this we're gonna have like mu and the sigma for the interpolation. We actually we did this we did this before like this. This. So what we did before using the sigma and mu is to develop the function. Okay. So we said this the the the, the, the lambda and xc. We already got the points. The V wind here, the wind and the probability of exceedance are coming from lambda and xc. So we got lambda and xc converted them then to xy points. This x1, xy points, the 1000 point draws the curve. And the second thing, we use this xy points to interpolate for the new wind speed that at this specific curve. Because the xy points are like 50, 52.1, 52.2, 52.3. But what if we have a 52.3567? So this is what this function takes the new value of the wind speed. This v is the exact wind speed at the building. Like this. So the first two inputs are the whole curve, right? Yeah. Which one? The, the first two inputs are yeah, the original curve, the original, term, the original mm -hmm. okay. and, and the third point is the exact wind at the building. So the various two points has nothing to do with the wind on the building. It, it's just the fragility. Read this fragility with these points for this building, and then use the wind speed that I calculated for this building to interpolate for the exact exceedance probability. Okay. So and that's what I did here. Does this for each of the yeah, so uh, here we have actually we have the archetype here. So 
based like I have the wind archetype for each building. So I have wind archetype for building. Uh, let's let's actually check this columns. Like if I go down there, this is the wind archetype. Each building has a number. So for each eye, actually this eye, one, two, three, four, five. So for I number four has archetype three, I number 11 has archetype four, I number 23 has archetype number one. So when I say here for, for I, when I here, because this loop will keep looping for 172,000 building, let's assume that we are in building number uh, 22. So when the I is equal to 22, so here you will have the probability of exceeding damage state for, build, for building number 22, and we are working with damage state one, you will interpolate the archetype for building number 22. So it's archetype three. So we'll go pick archetype three. It's kind of like matrices. So you are picking the right matrices for this building. Okay, so the next thing is to calculate the probability of being in, in each damage state. So what is the difference between the probability of exceedance a damage state and the probability of being in a damage state? The probability of being in a damage state is the difference between this and that. For example, this is the exceedance. It take all this value. Like all these values. This is the exceedance of damage state one. So all this. But if we are talking about what is the probability of exceedance, uh, oh, sorry, the probability of being in a damage state, so it will be this one. So we, if this is damage, let's let's throw it in another one. Okay. So let's... This is the image of state one. This is the image of state two. This is the image of state three. So this is the four damage of state that we have. So if the wind speed here, actually there is no damage. This is is damage of state one. This is its damage of state two. This is its damage of state three. This is its damage of state four. When we talk about this number, like if I came here, or if I came here and I go in this curve, this value, we call it exceedance probability. Like if we go from zero up to up there, this is the exceedance probability of the damage of state. Okay? All right. But if we are talking about the difference, so this is, is the probability of being in damage state one. And here is the probability of being in damage state two. This is the probability of being in damage state three. This is the probability of being in damage state four. So this is the 100% of the total probability of the building. Like it has part that has damage state one, part is damage state two, part is damage state three, part is damage state four. Sometimes when we assign a, uh, a damage state for a building, what we are interested in, what is not the probability of exceedance, we need to know what is the damage state of the building? Is this building slight damage, moderate damage, extensive damage? We, we check for the, the highest probability of being in a damage state, not the exceedance. For example, this building has a very, very low probability of being in damage state four. So it's not damage state four, but has the highest is damage state two. So the, this is the maximum probability. So that's what we are interested in when we assign um, a damage state. All right, so actually I'm, I'm gonna stop at this end. Next time, like on, on Tuesday, we are going to pick from this. I'm going to revise this one more time. I'm going to provide this code for you guys so that you can rise yourself with what we have. And next time, I'm going to talk more about how we calculate the probability of being in each damage state from the exceedance uh, probabilities. All right. I have a question. Yep. So we we inside which damage state in unit is based on all of it. So whichever state that has the highest value, that means the unit must be definitely for being that damage state. 
I, I don't understand that question. What is, what is that again? I mean, you know, we're saying, oh, we are getting informatics that the reading is in Damascus, right? So looking at what we have on the board now, it looks like Damascus 2 has the highest value. Yeah. So do we then say that that building falls on? Yeah. Damage? However, it has probability of being in damage state three, okay. but it's it's not as much as damage state two. Okay. And actually, one of the interesting points, and it's very debating, this sometimes doesn't feel reasonable or, or, or it has like to make decision. Sometimes let's assume that the probability of being in damage state two is 25, and, and the probability of being in damage state three is 24. They are very close to each other. So that's so this is also a research point that we are still working on to make decisions, what to choose. We sometimes like, what we are thinking about making scores, making scores and say, okay, it's on the far end of damage state three, so we can make another damage state. We can say high damage state two or, or low damage state three. And you will keep doing this, but sometimes we, that, that's why we are trying to shift because here you have four parameters, exceedance probability of damage state, one, two, three, and four for each building. And you have 170,000 building, lots of numbers. And we need to condense these fours to only one number about each building. And that's what we are trying to do. From these four numbers, tell me what is the damage state of this damage building? Like we, we want to know one number. Is it damage state two, three, or one? Don't tell me four numbers. So that's why we are moving from here to there. But it's a still, there's some kind of things, but this is the most accurate thing that we can do right now. Thank you. All right. Can we look at this board? Oh, sorry. Let me share the game. But the thing is, okay, yeah, 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 the thing one we want sigma and yeah. we got the points from and you put it here it's, oh, yeah. you put the value yeah. like do because because what i did here is coming from the same place yeah. so you, yeah. but you, yeah. to, you yeah. are around yeah. you can do many things in that yeah. actually can find a way to do the interpretation from uh, one that i see right now yes yeah. exactly wow. i didn't do it so there's like a way that i did but, and yeah. you can do lots of things to get the values. But you put them in the time. Is this all? 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 Is for sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.